he called me and he said, uh, well, I'm, I'm short staff here. I need someone to come in and, you know, help unload these containers. Can't you just tell them you nip over for a bit and let me just check in with Apple, Dad, if they don't mind putting the whole shoot on hold. Welcome to Story and Craft. Now, here's your host, Mark Preston. All right, here we are. Another episode of Story and Craft. Glad to have you. Thank you so much for swinging back by. Uh, if this is your first episode, my name is Mark Preston. Glad to have you checking out the show uh, for the first time of what I hope will be many times. And of course, I want to thank you. Uh, I really do appreciate uh, folks coming back by, checking out the show. Appreciate the notes I receive. And it's just very cool to have you be a part of great chats kind of like today featuring the very talented actor Dimitri Leonidas. He's in the new series called Those About to Die. It's a Roland Emmerich series on Peacock with the very talented Anthony Hopkins. And Dimitri, you probably know him from shows kind of like uh, Foundation on Apple Plus. He plays Hober Mallow, one of my favorite shows over the last couple of years. I really enjoyed the chat with Dimitri. We covered his experience from being a child actor all the way up to Those About to Die. Now, do me a favor, if you would, don't forget to please follow the show, whatever app you use to listen to Story and Craft, uh, follow it, make sure to leave a few stars, if you would, a little review. It does help people find the show, and if you follow the show, you get notified every time we have a new episode roll out. Uh, Don't forget, go to storyandcraftpod.com. Everything you could possibly want to know about the show, our guests, uh, even reach out to me. That is the best way to do it. Once again, storyandcraftpod.com. All right, let's get after it. Uh, Today, Dimitri Leonidas Day, right here on Story and Craft. How are you doing today, Dimitri? I'm great. I'm really well. Yeah, thank you. How are you? Now I'm doing wonderful. Just so I know how to say, is it Leonidas? Yeah, Leonidas. Ah, very good, very good. Yes, great. I mean, my dad always sort of despairs because people say Leonidas. I think the film 300 um, had a big influence on how people were saying it. And (laughs) uh, it was uh, always quite annoying to him when we'd do interviews or something and he'd watch it and they'd say Leonidas. Um, And he was always like, why don't you correct them? I thought, just because certain things you've got to just leave, Dad. Um, But yeah, yeah. Leonidas. You're in the UK right now, correct? Yeah, yeah, I'm in London. Yeah. And we've we've just started our summer. It's been a, a really late one. It, it, like most of June was shocking amounts of rain and, and grey sky and uh it's finally broken and now, you know, London is is it's just the best when the sun's out. It's uh it transforms the city. Um so yeah, great. It's 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 really nice here right now. Now, is your family with Leonidas? I'm assuming yeah, it's a it's a Greek descent. Yeah, Cypriot from from uh, from Cyprus. My dad was was born in Cyprus, and he moved to London when he was young. You know, four or five years old. His his parents moved over here um, with his you know brothers and sisters, and um, his parents eventually moved back. They they both passed away now, but um, they moved back to Cyprus. Uh, you know, after they retired, and um, and him and his brothers and, and and sisters all stayed here and raised families here. So uh, yeah, yeah, Cypriot heritage. And then I, I sometimes wonder why, you know, because Cyprus is like a paradise, and I think why did you come here? We, you could be on the beach, but uh, you know, it, it, London is a lot more opportunities, especially when he moved in, in the seventies, you know, what kind of work did, uh, what, what was his vocation? So, uh, when he was a younger man, my dad was an electrician. Um, and he then went into, uh, fruit and veg. He was, he was a greengrocer and, and then more wholesale fruit and veg. So he was sort of delivering, um, fresh fruit and vegetables to restaurants around London. And that grew a little more into, disposable goods, serviettes, you know, plates, cups, um, soft drinks. And, uh, and that is his little sort of empire. He's still, he's still working. He, he's got a warehouse in, in Wembley, sort of the industrial park in Wembley. And, uh, sometimes when I'm, you know, if I'm not working, I'll go and give him a hand. He'll, he'll give me a, a sort of call on a random, you know, day in the week and, and uh, asked me to go and help unload some shipping containers or something that's come in. 
Um, so you, you, so you're basically discount labor for them. Yeah, I mean the the funniest the funniest one was I was in Ireland filming Foundation, and uh, he called me and he said, uh, "Where are you? Where, where are you?" I said, "I'm I'm in I'm in Ireland, Dad. I'm I'm filming." And he he was like, "Oh," I said, "Why is everything all right?" And he's, he's well, I well I'm I'm short staff here. I need someone to come in and you know help unload these containers on on Monday and Tuesday. And I said, "Well, I'm I can't." I'm in Ireland, Dad. Can't you just tell them you nip over for a bit and give me, like, let me just check in with Apple, Dad, if they don't mind putting the whole shoot on hold for a few days so I can go and unload a container for you. Um, all right, well, don't worry about it. <laughs> and then, you know, he's, you know, we uh, we got off the phone. But, no, he's he's funny. You know, he's funny like that. He's working close. Did they shoot all of the foundation in Ireland or just the, the, uh, the parts you were in? No, it was actually just two weeks in Ireland and then um, two weeks in Ireland and then uh, we were in Tenerife for I think five or six weeks um, and then we sort of bounced around the other Canary Islands, Fuerteventura and um, La Gomera, yeah. I had no um, idea they had such a, uh, well, I guess somewhat exotic location, you know, shooting. It's not like they were in Atlanta, Georgia or something or there. You right. know. When you got that project, did you kind of like go, well, what exactly is this? You know, it's based off a book, right? The uh, Asimov, Isaac Asimov? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was aware, aware of the book. I, I'd read some of those sort of 60s sci-fi um books in the past you know like philip k dick and um some ray Brad bradbury and and i was into that stuff i'd never really read any asimov um so i did read the the foundation series in in preparation for this for the show and was totally blown away by them i mean I, the, the story is that elon musk you know when he sent that tesla into space i think there's still a tesla orbiting earth he put a copy of Foundation in the glove box. Really? Um, I didn't know that. Yeah. So there's a copy of Foundation floating in space, which is kind of apt given the nature of the show. Um, and Asimov was, was I think he, he had done a ton of research into the Roman Empire and, and the collapse of the Roman Empire and then writes a show that is like the Roman Empire, but in space. It's the collapse of a, of a, of a civilization. Um, and he pulls a lot of, the stories from how the Roman Empire fell, you know, it begins at the sort of the peripheries and, and, and equally something going wrong in the center. And, um, and he just mounts it as a giant space drama. Um, You're right. That does have a lot of uh, Roman empire esque, you know, uh, yeah. you know, this must be a theme that you're kind of sticking with, I guess. <laughs> you know, yeah, so. it, was, it was quite bizarre. Yeah. I mean, you know, to go and do sort of, Roman Empire in space and then do the actual Roman Empire. I was like, it's sort of twin twin stories in a way. Foundation, uh, I didn't know what to expect. It's one of those shows I watched the first episode. I was like, I don't really know how to get my head around this just yet. Yeah. But uh, the more I got into it, it, it was just really, you know, enjoyable. I think it, I think a lot of people have, have said that. I think the, the books are so dense and the idea is in them is, is so vast. The scale is so big that, I think it's hard for the first series and those first few episodes in, in the first series to to lay down the foundation, so to speak, of what you're doing because the books are so expansive. I mean, you turn you know you turn a page and and Asimov is jumping 150 years, yeah. And so everything yeah. that you've just read, all this investment that you've just made in in the characters and in their particular stories actually become just sort of dust in the wind it's like it's gone you're moving on again and there's some element of that story that is important to tell you to thread into the next timeline 150 years later and so by the time you finish with the book and you sort of step back it's the scale of time that Asimov is dealing with in those stories is 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 sort of quite a breathtaking scale really um and so I think the show in its in its you know, in, in its early stages did have to kind of, and the audience have to kind of get through some like expositional moments where you're going, you guys need to know this, this, and this. And now that you know that we can kind of go. And I think season two hits the ground running a little more um, because so much stuff has been established that you just, you can, you, you kind of just can, can, you know, run off with that momentum. 
I believe I'm totally caught up. Was there a, uh, is there another season? There is a third season um, that's shooting now in, in Prague. They're finishing up. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I will see how many they go, but yeah, there's, there's a third season that's, that's finishing, you know, wrapping shooting, I think in August. Yeah. I, I, I kind of enjoyed your, uh, I, I did enjoy your character. There was a very Han Solo esque vibe about your uh, character, which I, which I like. Yeah. I, apparently Hoba Mallow is, is the inspiration for Han Solo. Um, really? That, yeah. Yeah. He, he, that's the story that um, David Goyer told me and, and actually you know, there's some online threads about that, that, that Hoba Mallow is, is the inspiration for those sort of Han Solo. I'm learning all kinds of things today. I did not know yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I think Foundation is a, is a sort of uh, a tectonic plate of a, of a story that a lot of sci-fi has, has built on top of. Um, yeah, it, it is right at the base of so much, you know, sci-fi post the fifties. Um, it's, it's one of those, uh, foundational um you know uh sources there's one of the there's one of the show the expanse another kind of vibe similar to that yeah yeah. both featuring jared harris of course he seems like such an interesting he's just an interesting guy to watch just one more note on the foundation kind of what was the filming of that uh like it's it was incredible i mean i agree with you about jared i always think there's sort of part of me that always thinks whatever he's in I always sort of give the show more credit knowing that he's in it because he's just one of those actors that you go, he is great. And anyone, anytime someone chooses him, I sort of trust them immediately because um, he, he's got some qualities about him that when he's cast right, you just can't really imagine anyone else doing it. And, and so I had some scenes with him, lovely, hardworking. I mean, he had sort of, he's playing the, the, the founder of, psycho history so he's almost like an ai character for lack of a better way of putting it he's kind of like a real person slash ai you know yeah yeah and and has endless amounts of sort of dialogue to learn which you watch him just sort of turn up and deliver it and it's great every take and uh occasionally he'll sort of forget a line and all right sorry guys let's go again and i'm just watching going how are you not (laughs) how are you you know you're doing it once every eight takes is 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 a pretty good hit when you're just sort of running dialogue like that um but um, but yeah, the show David Goya, you know, screenwriter, director, producer of the show, um, is is just one that has this infectious energy, and and he's one of those guys that you really appreciate in our industry because you go, he's such a hardworking individual that it it really boosts. You know, the reason five hundred people turn up and from crew and actors and stunts and everything is because someone like him puts in so much legwork. Um, He's producing several things at once and writing several things. And I, I never understood how some of those folks do that, where they can have multiple oh, plates spinning at right. once. I'm like, okay, it would take up all my energy just to think of one, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. But I, I was curious, is kind of going back, were you uh, an only kid or did you have a big family or kind of kind of where did you fall in there? So um, I've got three sisters. Uh, <laughs> it's the title of a Chekhov play. Um, so I guess I was destined to be an actor, but um, yeah, two of my sisters act as well. Actually, Steph, the, my my older sister, and Georgina, the youngest, she was in Harry Potter. Um, oh, really? Okay. And yeah, yeah, and Steph has done you know loads of, of sort of cool movies. Well, was this part of your life for for your family? Was the theater or was acting part of what you were up to when you were uh, when you were young, or was this something y'all just all happened into? It, it was quite weird. My sisters were, were sort of into like singing and dancing and were going to these lessons and, and they eventually got into acting. I think the dancing stuff stopped and acting became the next fad. And, and so they were going to, it was, I, when I say sort of classes, it was, um, it was a room above a pub in Wembley and the lady that run the class, you could sort of, you know, drop your kids off um, after school and leave them there for an hour or two. And uh, and the, the the lady that run the class would sort of teach you know basic drama skills. At that age, it was it was more sort of acting games, um, sort of improvisation and stuff. And I I didn't really I had no interest in it. Um, but my mum was sort of encouraging me to go. I think she felt quite bad that I was just sort of hanging around the back of this pub, kicking a ball around for an hour and a half while my sisters were doing these drama classes. So I eventually went to one of them, and and. 
it just it just clicked. I I loved it. Um, I I found I had a confidence doing sort of improvisation um, that I didn't know where that came from. It just it just was something I I, I really enjoyed and uh, used to think about. It. it was only once a week after school on a Thursday, and I'd spend the rest of the week sort of wondering, oh, what would happen? What's going to happen next week? You know, the, this excitement of the, the the spontaneity of improvising and and um, this sort of stored energy that you have as a kid suddenly all clicking and just requiring you to to to, to work. Well, kids all you know, all kids have that sense of play already kind of built yeah. in. You know, it's an avenue. Well, you said this was taking place uh, in a in the back of a pub. You say, yeah, it was a initially it was just a room above a pub above, yeah. in, in Wembley. Um, and as as the sort of years passed. They found slightly more, I guess, appropriate <laughs> venues to, to host. These, I was about um, to say that's got to be really interesting, given the, the uh, things that happen at a pub. You know, to be able to have a yeah, lot of kids there. Yeah. You know, it's a quite festive. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, when you were in school, were you uh, was this was this kind of like your outlet, or were you also doing like sports or uh, other kind of activities as a kid? Yeah, I guess I, I I wouldn't say I was the sportiest kid. I mean, I played football and and. Uh, um, you know, I, I, the, the acting thing kind of, I had a few jobs when I was a, a, a sort of teenager, but I never really wanted my friends at school to know about it too much. It was one of those things that was more a reason that you might, you know, get picked on or, mm-hmm. um, it just wasn't something that I, I wanted people necessarily to know. Um, and then obviously I was away for, sort of six, seven weeks. We, we'd, uh, there was a TV show I did called Grange Hill, which is a, um, a school show. It's, a, it's, a, it's about a high school. It's, it's very well known in the UK because it was a sort of working class high school show um, that had been running for when I was in it. It had been on for 25 years kind of thing. It was this long-standing show. And, and, uh, and so I was, we'd film most of it over the summer holiday, but a few weeks would run into the school year. And so when I went back to school, some people would ask what I was doing and, and rumour got out that I was in this show. And, and I remember one kid saying, you're just lying. You're just saying it so that people respect you. And I kind of thought, good, <laughs> let everyone think I'm lying. Um, because it just it just kept people off your back, you know, attention in high school, that sort of attention. was. What not- was the show already out or was this... Uh- uh, or was it, it- the, the show was long running, but the stuff I had filmed wasn't out until the sort of next term kind of thing. So we'd film over the summer holidays and into the, 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 the beginning of the school year. And then it would come out sort of, I guess, I guess in a few months time. And, uh, and then once it was out, it was kind of this weird thing where people were watching it. And, and there's a sort of weird response to, to being in a show when you're at school like that. How old were you roughly when the, when the, you were shooting? I mean, I would have been about twelve or thirteen. Oh, okay, okay. I was I was, I was quite young, so it's kind of a weird thing to do, and 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 uh, you do feel like you're sort of coexisting in two different worlds, you know, high school life and and all the the trimmings that come with that, and then a professional environment um, that is uh, that that has its own sort of peculiarities, really. Being on telly and the certain um, whirlpool of, of that world, um, and seeing sort of kids, you know, having their eyes sort of like open to the idea of maybe being actors. I mean, I never saw it that way, but I remember some people, you know, you could easily get carried away in 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 that. It, it, you know, some of the, the the kids that went that were in the show were from more drama school background so this was something they would have been planning i always imagine over there that, that it's more people start in theater you know kind of that's kind of the cliche idea everybody's studying shakespeare out of the gate you know yeah yeah was it received like in a, were people thinking hey this is really cool or were they you know being that age things are awkward enough as it is where they kind yeah. of were you getting singled out like okay this this punk over here thinks he's something special you know well i, I remember getting out of the train station one day and going to school and some guy, these guys in hoodies saw me and were like, you know, swore at me and you're that, you know, guy off the telly, give me your phone and sort of tried to, to sort of surround me. And, and I kind of just carried on walking. But so for me, it really wasn't something that I, 
I was proud of it. I was I, I felt great about being in it, but the, the sort of social status that came from it um, was not something that I was in an environment where that would necessarily put you up higher in the hierarchy. I mean, um, it it felt great to be in the show and it was a sort of privately, I, I, I was beginning to sort of see that there was an opportunity here for a career in it as well. I was like, okay, it, it came out of nowhere that, you know, getting this job, um, the lady that run these drama classes above the pub, she had these connections to certain casting directors and, and she'd said to my parents, look, I would like to put Dimitri up for some stuff. I think he could, you know, do it. How would he feel about it? How would you guys feel about it? And um, I was, of course, like, yeah, great. You know, so I did some extra work. Um, often this sort of like crime shows that were on telly, they would want, you know, sort of street, more urban kids as, as extras in the background. And they would go to this this um, this sort of drama class after school because she had a lot of kids from local estates that she had just helped prepare to go into, you know, almost, you know, credit to her. But through osmosis, just being at those lessons, you kind of, you did have this sort of preparation to go in, and even if it's just to do a few days of extra work, you know. So to, was, to, was your mind shifting in the direction of like, okay, this may be what I want to do when I'm a grown up, you know, or were, yeah. were you still thinking this is cool for now and uh, there's something else on the agenda that you were thinking that would be really cool to do for a living? Uh, what, what was your aspiration? I know it's only 12 and 13 years old, but yeah. were you thinking there was something else you wanted to do as well? No, I think I think I... I started to realize like that I I really enjoyed it. I I think it's hard because looking back I go what what point did I really solidify in my mind? And it's hard to identify exactly, but but I think at that time I remember thinking there is a potential it, you know because it's so when you at that at that time going into acting felt like something that other people did um and putting yourself in an environment where you're doing it and then you're watching yourself on telly and you're going oh this is what it is it's like the process is already something i'm undergoing you learn your lines and you turn up and you have long days of filming but these this is what the job is and so it kind of pulled away the mystique of of you know film and television and, and actually felt like something quite real um and I think that at that point it started to calcify in my head as as something I really wanted to do, and and so I continued to sort of pursue it and and you know move up through through different agents and stuff. And I didn't go to drama school, and as you say, that is the traditional route, very much still in the UK, is is learning your your craft through um, through drama school and and through theatre training. And so having not done that, I always felt a little bit like, am I missing out? What what am I not? You know, I'm, I haven't gone through formal training. I'm just sort of winging it. Um, but I guess I had the advantage of having some experience and and knowing what the ins and outs of a day on set entail. Yeah, but it definitely was a job in your mind. You could kind of see this as being a vocation because I hear yeah. you know some younger kids, uh, some uh, child actors I'd spoken with over the years. They've said you know they that was kind of fun for them, but they didn't really mm -hmm. perceive it as. Oh, I can make a living doing this thing, you know. So that was that's kind of a nice little epiphany. And did you stay in school like as things progressed, you know, 12, 13, did you stay in school or did you start getting a lot of a lot more work and we're doing the kind of the on set where they call it, the tutoring? Yeah, I mean I mean there was whilst we were doing the show there was there was tutoring, but I was I was in school, you know, um I I did college as well. Um so I kind of went through as far as I felt was was sort of I should in terms of formal education, you know, academic education. Um, I went to college, but I sort of knew in the back of my mind I was going to try and take a swing at acting. I was going to try and get a slightly better agent off the back of having done, you know, a few bits of television work. Um, and and you know, at that point, it's it is they're the hardest years really, where you're sort of like you know, trying to figure out how realistic it is, knowing that there's an element of it's up to the sort of gods in a way, you know, you, there, there's so much that's in your uncertainty. Yeah. And, 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 you know, my dad, you know, as I explained, the sort of in, in the background of all that is sort of building his, 
his business and and I think was quite keen for me to sort of go in into that and take over what he'd started and so you know I I had to sort of try and juggle those things and and uh I mean he's extremely supportive now but understandably you know <laughs> telling my uh, green gross dad that I want to go into like acting what did your mother was she also a Cypriot or did he meet your mother in the UK they met in the UK um and and you know it was my mom I guess who really was sort of encouraging us to sort of try these things you know try and go to these extracurriculum activities and so my sisters were doing bits of singing and dancing as I said and um and she passed away when I was young my mom passed away when I was 13 um, oh my so it was kind of mad you know like three sisters and myself and my dad all trying to figure out how to proceed you know because you're 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 beyond the sort of tragedy of it is is the absurdity of it which is like now what like and and the, you know coming to terms with it in just a, a sort of everyday way um and it and and so you know um in that sort of chaos i think you grow up quite quickly in your head you sort of go okay well well the acting that that was right about the time you were doing the show I mean, the acting had to been somewhat of a escape for you at least a little bit yeah yeah it it was yeah, it was. And and I think it was like kind of schizophrenic in my head in a way that I was already trying to not bring the acting part. It was not something I was sort of bringing into the school too much. And then in the background of that, with my mum, there was like a third narrative going. And so I think I got used to, I think as you get older, you used to, you, you, you do naturally have several parts of yourself that, that operate. And I think quite quickly, I, I, I sort of had to dissect parts of myself and go, this isn't useful. You know, I mean, I mean, I remember my sister saying to me, she was like, try and not let what's going on with us at home affect what you're doing on the job. And and I thought it was a really mature thing for her to say. It was like, uh, and, and I totally understood why she was saying it. But, um, you know, so it was a lot of like, very quickly learn learn to, to to adapt to environments that are, are changing and and um and strange yeah and that that time of life is awkward enough as it is so that had to be, you know, yeah, yeah totally at least you had this your your father your sister's there did you know did, you know you have a, me growing up as an only child I, I i have three kids i live vicariously through them what's it like to have siblings you know right, because okay. as an only kid i had a dog you know that was about as close as we got one last question i, I always end up talking food at least once every episode and one of my some of my favorite food is from that Part of the you know the the, the Cypri cook the, the the cuisine is very very much similar to Greek don't they don't they have like yeah, li- yeah. long lifespans isn't that kind of a Cypriot thing because of the way they eat yes or? no you're right there's a, there's a Greek island where it has the oldest living inhabitants they're all living till like 110 115 and and it's exactly what you say it's it's olive oil it's fresh fish. It's seasonal vegetables. Is your father a cook or was that something he didn't know? I mean, I, mean, I mean, does he know how to make some of these? No, things? is the answer to that. I mean, he, you know, he, um, he loves his food. My dad, um, he's not, he's not necessarily a good cook, but his sisters. So my aunties, um, would always sort of bring Greek food around, you know, Easter. And- he'll, he'll provide the groceries. He'll provide the groceries. Yeah. Yeah. I was curious, have you stayed, uh, have you always kind of uh, lived in the UK or have you tried living in LA or have you kind of moved around or has this always been your home base? This has always been my home base. Although over the last, I'd say sort of 10, 12 years, I've probably spent half of that time working abroad. I always seem to get jobs that are like six, seven months abroad. In, in, in I've been really fortunate that it's been, you know, I spent like a year in Malta filming a TV show and, and really six, seven months in Berlin um, uh, a few months in Barcelona. The job, the jobs that I, I'd landed over the last sort of decade or so were predominantly filmed abroad. So it was it, it was always nice to come home. Actually, I I, I love traveling. Love you know it, it's it's something that I, I do even in in my off off time. But um, getting to do that with work is 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 a real privilege. Oh, that's that's pretty awesome. I mean, that's one of the things I always wanted to do is is have a gig where I can be able to travel, you know, and being able to go, you're not just traveling to like, like LA or again, we'll say like Atlanta, Georgia and the U S 
you're going to some kind of nice exotic places. So it's, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Those about to die. Where, where did y'all shoot that? So we shot that in, in Italy, in Rome. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And they have um, the studios there, Cinecitta, and uh, and also some sets that was, were outside of the studio. So there was, there was a remake of Ben Hur a few years ago. And for that film, they had built, circus maximus um and that set is still there and so really for, yeah it's it, it's amazing set actually and and for the chariot racing and training that i had to do and also for, for filming we were using that circus maximus set um yeah it's funny you say that because i was watching it i was thinking well of course there i'm sure there's some element of cgi because you can't just recreate rome you know mm -hmm. can't rebuild rome but but i'm going okay this guy really looks like he's doing some horse stuff you know so right. you know so the what kind of training did you have to go through to kind of prepare yourself to have a team of four horses yeah yeah <laughs> you know how did, how did you do that so we we were called out the sort of charioteers were called out to rome a little earlier and and were given a sort of intensive training which involved a few things at first it was like going to stables and spending time with horses and and uh my character has um there's a few scenes with with a horse in the show called Incitatus, which is a real horse it was a famous horse in rome and uh so because of that they were like we need to sort of match you with the, with the right horse for these scenes and um so one of the first things i had to do was go and like spend time with a few different potential Incitatus horses um and you know the first one I, I i met was this veteran actor horse that had been on a bunch of like films and television shows and was a bit older and, and a little bit more um you know a little bit more subdued he was used to being around people he, he was used to being on set so it was kind of easy to to groom him and deal with him but something about it just didn't feel right it was like it felt too easy or something and then in the end, you know, we went for this other horse called Silaro. My first encounter with him was just, I was in complete awe. He was huge, this huge muscular horse that um, seemed completely like unimpressed. And, uh, and it and seems like an interesting matchmaking thing they're doing here. You, you know, with you and a horse that, that's, yeah, was, uh... you know, they, they wanted it to feel right, I think. And, and, you know, when I got back, you know, after the day, I, Roland, the director was asking me, he was like, so what happened with those horses? And I said, there's this one horse that is just so terrifying. It's like super intimidating. It's like this sort of dragon sized horse um, that uh, it's never done any sort of television work. It's, it's, so it's not um, accustomed to sort of being on set or anything, but the horse is so sort of intimidating um, and impressive looking that I just thought it has to be, it has to be this horse. And that's, that's who we went with. And, um, yeah, and then and then you know slowly getting us used to the chariots. We started off on on carriages and just where you sort of sit and and go on the carriage and go around Circus Maximus and then upgraded to to actual chariots, which which were terrifying at first. It's like standing on a, a skateboard. Um, Roland really wanted to sort of go with a sort of more sporty design chariot that was very small um, and very sort of fast looking. And therefore not the safest um so you know you're it's like standing on this sort of little little skateboard with i was about to say it sounds kind of like even in just kind of watching the they, they weren't these really robust things they were just yeah. kind of like just a couple of wheels a little thing to stand in and yeah. it's yeah yeah, you. yeah. Um, and then four giant hungarian stunt horses that are like you know when they want to go they just want to rip it's like they're it it's the, the feeling of, of those horses at full power is, is phenomenal. It's like, it's, it's like an earthquake at the end of your hands. It's, it's just, I mean, those guys are crazy. The stunt guys are absolutely crazy. Those Hungarian boys that, that actually were doing the races. And then you think like they're crazy, but the guys in Rome 2000 years ago doing the races without, all the specific equipment that they have for the horses today that make it a little more. Yeah. And paramedics. You know? <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. yeah. There was one quote, somebody said that, uh, that horse meets worth more than an injured racing guys. Like it, the cool thing for me was in watching this was that it was a, um, 
It reminded me a little bit of the history I probably should have paid a little bit more attention to in school. But it was what was the life? What was the daily life? What was the ebb and flow for the from the peasant folk all the way up to the to the Anthony Hopkins types, the, the emperor? He kind of saw it in a three dimensions as opposed to just, you know, something that seems historical. Mm-hmm. Did you have any epiphanies in doing this or learn something or uh, anything about the ecosystem of the Roman life or whatever you want to call that? I mean, was there something you picked up on? You, you were just kind of like pleasantly surprised uh, to learn? I mean, there was this great podcast a friend gave me before I started called the History of Rome podcast. And uh, it, it really is phenomenal. It started out as a, as a pet project for him and, and it it started to build a, a quite a large audience. And then he just commits fully to, I think he quits his job and just commits to making this podcast. And so I was listening to that whilst, you know, shooting. And um, there's so many really interesting little stories that um i mean vespasian was an emperor that created public lavatories uh and so in in rome in italy they call them Ves- vespacianos i think is the public lavatories he 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 created those things so there's all these really sort of tiny little stories and, and nuggets of of cool it cool pieces of info that, that come out um you know in in, in researching the show and, and that that period of time i think for me, it was trying to get my head around just they see the world slightly different to us. In many ways, you know, we talk about Rome being the basis of our civilization today, and it is in so many ways. The idea of bread and circus, the politics, the, the class system, all of it is, is, you know, we can draw a line from that time to today in so many of these sort of large, um, these sort of large things that, that still exist today. But there's also an element where they saw the world so differently to us. And that was was kind of fascinating that we we sort of are far more i think atheistic and 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 post sort of psycho you know psychotherapy we we analyze our behavior in certain ways that you have to you know for a show like this in particular you have to be very careful you don't you're not too clinical with your approach to these characters because somewhere you can sort of squeeze the ghost and the mystery out of them. There is a quote um, that I thought was really interesting uh, that, that that they could see the artifice, but that's actually what they wanted. You know, in, in other words, that, yeah. that's part of the theater of the whole thing. I think it was with the scene when you were kind of like pulling back in the, in the race. Right. Yeah, and I know then you, you know, yeah. and everybody yeah, kind of yeah. see, okay, this is some BS, man. We know what he's about to do, <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's almost like yeah. pro wrestling in a way, right? Right, but that's part of the theater of it. Exactly, there's so many parallels. I mean, you know, in cool ways, but also some kind of scary ways. You start talking about the ebb and flow of a of an empire, and if you look at the U.S. right now, and there's some there's some interesting parallels, you know. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. But I'm imagining. I know my daughter just got back from uh, Rome, and she went to Umbria as well. And uh, she got back. I was just asking her all all the food she had to eat. You know, and she she apparently is not going to want to have any pasta for a little while. But <laughs> what was food service like? What was a craft service like when you were there uh, in Rome? It's incredible. Was it kind of your standard TV show stuff? No. Or were that was it like some real deal Italian? Mark, honestly, it's like. The food, you know, food, it, it's the cliche, but it is true. You know, bad food is insulting to Italians. And and they they really, you know, they really took care of us. The catering team out there was, I mean, it, it was just superb. I can't, you know, I've been on some sets where it's like, should we just like Uber eat something? Because I really don't want to eat this, this sort of set food. It's just not. It just feels sort of scary that you might, you know, eat something and, and uh, not be able to work for the rest of the, the day, you know. But this was not the case in Italy. It's like, and the funny thing is, you know, as well, not just on set, it's it's the, the sort of places, the restaurants that um, that sort of a quiet little pay place down an alleyway that you find and you go in and you're like, doesn't seem to be anyone there, but maybe it's because of the time of day. And then the pizza they give you is the best pizza you've ever tasted. And it's like, it's all these tiny little cafes that um, they just do food properly. Yeah. Isn't there like a whole thing, a whole idea that, that, that they may do one thing amazingly well. And one place is known for one thing and you got to go over there for that yes. one thing. I mean, I would, I would get lost and pick up, put on, I mean, ridiculous amount of pounds, you know, spending time there. 
so, so what are you working on right now? You know, what is coming up for you? So you're shooting a series like this. Uh, same thing with the foundation. Do, do you ever kind of need like a break or do you get a little antsy when you're not shooting something? I mean, when you're kind of like, geez, I want to get back to work. You yeah. know, working is always great. It's always nice to have to have that. But I've learned to, to sort of use the time off as productively as possible. I think you, especially when you're first sort of starting out, it's very easy to let that time sort of ever away with anxiety about what's coming next and is anything coming next. Um, and um, when you, you know, when a job does come along, you sort of go, I, I wish I just sort of did the things that I want to do in that time. I wish I read more books. I wish I, you know, went running more. I, you know, I like to do sort of indoor climbing and um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu and, and you kind of don't do any of those things, especially when you're starting out because you've got no money. And you're like, you're trying to sort of yeah, yeah. Know how long yeah. this sort of pay packet has to last to pay your rent. So you sort of don't branch out into your other interests until you somehow feel a little more secure and you're never going to feel totally secure. I think, you know, unless. Um, yeah, I remember a long time ago, I think I was speaking to John uh, Favreau. This is going, guy, wow. 20. I don't even think of how long ago that was. I mean, I'm getting older. Um, but he says something that's like, yeah, you know, whenever a movie or a show wraps, I'm out of work. I, I never really framed it like that. Like, oh, really? I guess you're I guess you're right. As far as projects go, what, what kind of things do you have coming up? Or even, you know, what kind of things are you looking to want to do, you know, coming up here? Uh, is there anything you haven't done that you're like, I would really like to grab a hold of a project like this? What would that be? Um, I mean, I, I feel very fortunate in the last few years to have been on a range of, of projects and shows that are all quite different. Um, you know, from sort of sci-fi to war dramas, um, to, to sort of modern day to like ancient Rome. I kind of had to sort of stop when this job finished and look back and go, if I'd, someone had told me 10 years ago that I would have done these things, it, it, I, I would have, you know, grabbed, I would have said, yes, please, you know, if that is, is where I could be in 10 years. So, so I kind of like, have tried to sort of go a little more inwards and, and figure out what it is I personally want to do and, and the things that really sort of draw sort of sources of inspiration for me. And then it's really bizarre because that sort of can lead you down um, a path of like, you know, you end up with five, six, seven books that you're going reading all at once. And, uh, and, um, and that opens up more doors to something else. And then there'll be some, you know, eccentric artist that you, you discover through that process that you momentarily become sort of obsessed with. And, and, and so I'm in that world of just, you know, there's lots of things that sort of appeal to me and, and, um, finding time to do it all and, 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 you know, read the books that I want and, um, I, I, I bought a, a camera recently and have been, you know, shooting and, and getting to know the, the intricacies of it and, and the sort of the, the, the few lenses that I bought and playing with them and going on to DaVinci Resolve and, and learning the editing software. And so, like, for me, it's like I could I could do that forever because um, I love I, – I, I'm starting to really enjoy that. Um, but, of course, you know, work work is, is, is essential and, and – the process of, of like being with other people and doing it is great. Yeah. I, I know what you mean about that. Davinci resolve. You can kind of go down a little rabbit hole. Like as if you've got a creative mind, you want to go. Right. You got into the fusion element, elements of DaVinci. The, the, the I problem. haven't even gotten into the things, the real horsepower of the thing. It's I, insane. I mean, most I've done was this most rudimentary, you know, just a basic editing as it were. But I mean, there's so much you can do. Yeah, yeah. Do you find yourself uh, like, oh, next time I'm on set, I want to go hang out with the DP and ask him some questions. Yeah, you know? What kind exactly of lenses? That. Why are you using the lenses? Yeah. You know? <laughs> exactly that. It really is that, yeah. As we you know, head towards uh, wrapping up here, one thing I, I do like to do, I have my what I call my seven questions. Okay. I always like to kind of throw out and just, just a little fun, a little extra fun here. And we were talking food a moment ago, so it always comes up a bunch. Mm -hmm. um, of the seven questions, first one's always, what is your favorite uh, comfort food? You know, I love ribeye steak. I love ribeye steak. It's um, It's... It's a it's a meal that I always feel very satisfied at the end. It cooked properly, 
with some maybe some some broccoli, some garlic, and a little bit of chili uh, with the broccoli. That that is that is always super satisfying to me. And then and then um, you know on the slightly maybe less healthier side, a good fried chicken burger. Um, love that. Uh, you said a fried chicken burger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know the the folks are the the folks uh, in your neck of the woods I've spoken with. Uh, I learned what spag bowl is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That sh- that's shown up more than once. I can imagine, yeah. But of course, being in Italy. I had the, the best spaghetti, yeah. Um, now, the second question is, if you're going to sit down, you're going to talk story, like just like a few hours, coffee, you, three people, living or not, who would those three people be that you would like to just have at the table with you uh, for conversation? Um, David Lean, who, who directed uh, Lawrence of Arabia and... Um, all those, all those great epics. Um, I think he'd be fascinating. He's a sort of Kubrick esque figure in a way, um, and um, Kubrick, <laughs> you know, would be would. It, it's always hard with these questions because for me, I always go, "How can it not be Stanley Kubrick?" In a way, it's just, you know, his his work is, um, you know, un, un, well, what is what what is your uh, if you have a Kubrick project, just like okay, it's definitive. What would that Kubrick film be for you? I think Barry Lyndon. You know, you sort of go through a process of all of them being at some point a sort of favorite, but Barry Lyndon is maybe um, the one that that I think is is just sort of stunning as as a film. Um, and it, it, he famously designed. Uh, he worked along. Uh, alongside NASA to develop these new lenses that could pick up light in um, that could pick up candlelight. So he wanted to shoot the whole film in candlelight, which with the technology at the time just wasn't really possible. The lenses couldn't pick up that level of um, details. You know, it was just too dark. So he, you know, he 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 gets NASA to help him out, and they design a whole new set of lenses so that he can get what he wants. And all the conspiracy theories start that he went and, you know, shot the moon landing on a set. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Exactly that. Yeah. For me, it was full metal jacket. For me, it was like a, like an interesting journey to take, yes. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Would you have another person at the table with you can think of that, you know, living, like, again, living or not, who would that be? Um, I'm going to end up with three directors here, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, Jonathan Glazer, who, who directed... Um, his first film was Sexy Beast, then Birth, then Under the Skin, and recently Zone of Interest. Um, I just think he's, uh, you know, I, each one of his films, they, they share no DNA. Like, they don't, you don't know that it, there's a Jonathan Glazer movie because there's nothing about them that... Really? Yeah, I mean, he just totally caters even the form of the film to suit the sort of themes and, and the, the requirements of the film. I mean, he makes a film every 10 years or something and spends that decade, I think, totally focusing on what the emergent needs of this project are. So by the time it comes out and sees it, the, and, and you see it, they're, they're like alien films in a way, because you're like, there's nothing quite like it. He, is, he has designed the film in, in a way that tells the story the exact way it needs to be told, you know, disregarding how we sort of, the, uh, you know, a mass audience sort of feels about a third act structure and, and, and I, I don't know if I'd have the patience to do a film once every 10 years. I, I would be get too antsy. Like I want to get there. I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's quite a marathon. So, so that begs a question. Are you wanting to direct at some point in time? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think I would. I, I, they'd probably be quite sort of small things that, that I think, I think working on, on films with so many people and, and, and they're kind of, you know, big epics. It, I quite like the idea for now anyway of of paring it all down to something very small and and um and and simplistic and and maybe just for me just playing around as you were saying you know with with da vinci and stuff with sort of more art installation y type things with narrative still but but just playing around with image and sound and and seeing how you can push that 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 right now is sort of quite appealing to me well, I mean, with all the locations you get to go on, right, yeah. you know, you can take your camera yeah, out and start yeah, yeah. farting around and, you know. True, yeah. Um, now, next question I got for you is, going back when you were young, who was your first celebrity crush when you were a kid? M- mine was um, mine was quite a weird one when I think about it now. Um, it was Jean Seberg. You know, the French actress. She was in a Buddha play, the French film. Um, 
she had a kind of crazy life. She, I think she ended up being assassinated or something. She had had a, an, an affair with, um, she had an affair with a politician, I think. And, uh, and there's a mystery around her death, but, um, yeah, Jean Sebo, the French, the French actress, she had really short hair. It's sort of Mia Farrow-esque in, in Rosemary. Oh, okay. Time. Okay. And I just, in like what, in like what decade was she? I mean, you know, it would have been, thing? I guess it was like French new wave. So it would be like, is that the seventies? Seventies, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sounds about yeah. right. I'm learning things. I'm like, okay, I got to go check this out. You know, <laughs> there, there are so many things that I happily have not, you know, at my age, I'm like, yeah, it's kind of cool. I haven't checked that right. out yet. Okay, right, well, there's right. one more thing that I'm not aware of that I get to go check out. So, uh, and I, and again, I learned that, hey, you've, you, you know, the whole connection with Han Solo and right. uh, yeah. uh, Hober Mello. Uh, so that's part of the reason why I like doing this because I learn things. Uh huh. Sure. Now, if you're going to be going to, to live, uh, the next question, you're going to be on an exotic island somewhere, somewhere you really want to be, but you're going to be there for a year. There's no internet. Um, so you need to bring one album with you, a CD and one DVD, one movie. What would that one movie and one album be that you could, that could ride out the year with you on the island? Oh, I think the, the album that springs to mind is um, an album called Oakland... Asul Asylum by a band called Y. In fact, any one of their albums I'll take. Um, it was an album, their, their music I was listening to a lot in my 20s. Um, and it, it was just so different to everything else I'd heard. And Like how, what a genre do they fit it's out? It's really hard to explain. I find it really hard to explain because it's like they kind of have elements of, of, like they develop something called like cloud rap, this sort of hypnotic, almost, you know, sounds over, um, over sometimes incomprehensible, you know, lyrics that you just sort of almost meditative style. And then other times there's a sort of, you know, a kind of just, you know, music band vibe as well. They're just sort of playing instruments and, and, and singing, but they, they're from San Francisco, uh, I believe. And, uh, if you can get hold of any of their albums, I, it, it, it's so cool. They're so sort of life affirming and fun. Um, I definitely, I definitely need to check it out. Cause I like, again, I'm learning, you know, and I've spent some time working radio and I got, right. there are very few genres that I don't have some favorites in, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. but I like checking out things I've never heard of before, okay. you know, cause I have a, I mean, I think some of my kids think I have a weird taste in music, but <laughs> yeah, so be it. Uh, <laughs> I'm a weirdo. I like, I, you know, it's like I, I got, I got the things I like, you know. No, I was like that. Though, I think. Now, the next question: If you were to say, you know, we forgot actually what the what the what was the movie going to oh, be movie. because we knew the album. Yes, the I'm movie, sorry, I like brain farted um, there. What would the movie be for you? Maybe Chinatown. Ah, very good. Yeah, that that that's a good one. Yeah, I find myself sometimes sitting on the sofa going, "What have I not seen in a long time? I would like to go back and check out, like Chinatown." I haven't seen that in 20 years, you know. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's phenomenal. I'm, I'm definitely in the camp of, like, one of the best sort of screenplays ever written. Uh, now, if you're, again, for the next question, from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep, what are the component parts of a perfect day for you? What elements would be, you know, if you said this was this was a great day? Okay, okay. I like to get up and, and leave, leave my flat quite quickly. Um I just find getting up and getting out is sort of an impulse for me that, that I, I like to do it just sort of hanging around. I can, you know, get into a sort of like waste an hour on the couch, looking at my phone or, you know, so I like yeah, to get out yeah. and go get a coffee somewhere. Um, a nice cafe, you know, get my coffee in. Um, maybe, maybe do some reading for an hour or so. Um, and then, you know, I guess, I guess any any sort of combination or mixture of like um, something active, with, whether it's like indoor climbing or, or playing football at a certain point in that in the day, um, some sort of physical activity, even half an hour at the gym or something. Um, get all the sort of stuff done that I need to do. I like to get all that done early. You know, if there's any emails or anything I've got to send. Um, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. You know, I just yeah. I just feel like it, it it can linger in your head as the day goes on. Whereas if you get it sorted, I go the day, the evening is now mine. Um, you you want your day doing your thing, and the only way you yeah. get there is getting all the other stuff out of the way. Get all that yeah. done. Um, 
and it would end with a film, I guess, you know, and he it, it cook some nice food and, and some kind of film would be, would be great. Yeah. Um, so it's not tea, it's coffee. Us Brits do not have tea. But <laughs> Actually, that, that's why my daughter brought me back from uh, Rome. Right. Uh, it's two, two bags of, um, of uh, a coffee, like a coffee bean. So I'm like, r- I'm raring to get into that. My coffee grinder broke. So I got to buy another, co- another, another coffee grinder so I can enjoy that. Um, now, if you weren't doing the next question, if you weren't doing this for a living, if this wasn't your vocation, what could you see yourself finding joy in doing besides this? Wow. I mean, as, as we spoke about earlier, you know, because this has been such a, a sort of part of my life since I was young, it is hard to sort of pull out of this time zone and this reality and go, what would be an alternative sort of reality to live in? And, and um, in some ways it's cheating a little bit because I, I, I would like to still do something in, in film. Um, but m- maybe if, if I had to remove the film industry entirely or like the process of making films in any capacity, I, I really don't know, you know. And that's kind of scary a little bit. Um, that's actually affirming because uh, reaffirming the that you're in the right place. You know, if you can see, if you can't see yourself doing anything else, you know, you're in the right place. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, which I think all actors have to have because you have to go through such an arc of experience, at least early on. It's not very lucrative, let's say, you know, well, the last question I got for you, if you were to jump into that quintessential DeLorean Mm -hmm. and travel back in time, 16 year old, you, you're going to sit down and have, uh, you know, some advice you can pass along to make that moment somehow better or to make the, you know, set yourself up a little bit different. What would that piece of advice be that you would offer yourself? Um, it's always a good question, you know, and it's like, I, I do sometimes think, you know, what, what would, what would I do differently if you could? And, and in some ways I think because of dealing with certain things when I was younger, I kind of had downloaded, you know, certain experiences just offer an abundance of, of, of treasure in terms of, of, you know, lessons learned. And so I think I've always appreciated things. I've always had it in me to sort of go, you know, don't always give yourself a hard time. Don't like berate yourself when things go wrong. Um, and so I think, I think my advice would be just to get going a little earlier on the things I love. I I wish I wrote more. Um, I wish I got into a habit of writing earlier. Um, I think being able to write means you're able to think and you're able to communicate. And I think being able to communicate puts you at such an advantage um, because you're just able to express ideas to other people and share. And, and, and I think writing is one of those things that I kind of always wanted to do a little bit and, and never really committed. I think I would jump into that a little bit earlier if I could. Um, and maybe even a few other things like, you know, I wish I, I, I discovered Brazilian Jiu Jitsu quite late. I was I was like twenty nine thirty when I started doing it, and and I saw. Well, it's kind of funny because like uh, I was a big fan of Anthony Bourdain. Yes, uh, yes, uh, you know, was... back in the day. I know he kind of came by that late, and then towards the end of his life, he was yeah. in really great shape. Was... I was like, maybe that's an idea for me. I'm like, I'm too lazy for that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's but it's uh, but good on you for that. But but no, I'll t- tell you what, uh, uh, Dimitri, I really appreciate you taking time Likewise. out. I, Thank you. I'm looking forward to getting getting further into uh, those about to die as it comes out uh july 18th july 18th yeah yeah i i've i've enjoyed what you know i've gotten into it and i kind of want to kind of like pace myself because mm-hmm. i have this habit of binging things yeah yeah like, i know that now it's gone you know yeah, that's it <laughs> well thank you again i so appreciate it but uh take care you too. thank you very much all right, there you go, Dimitri Leonidas, the new show, Those About to Die. It's on Peacock, coming out July 18th. Very good show. Really enjoyed the series. Uh, it's based, again, in the Roman Empire, and it is very expansive, visually cool to check out. Uh, great stories. I mean, it's just a fun ride. I think you'll enjoy it. Hey, do me a favor, if you would, don't forget to follow Story and Craft on your favorite podcast app. Drop a few stars, if you would. A little review. It helps people find the show. Plus, if you follow, you get notified every time there's a new show. And we have some great ones coming up here soon. And also, you want to drop me a note, feel free to do so. Go to Story and Craft Pod 
www.thepeopleshow.com. Great way to reach out and let me know what's up. What are you thinking about the show? What are you up to? Just reach out and say howdy. Always good to hear from you. All righty, that's it for today. Again, thank you for coming by. Enjoy uh, having you with me every episode. It means a lot, so thank you very much. I'm going to get on out of here, grab a bite to eat. You go have a great rest of your day, evening, uh, weekend, week, whatever you're up to. Thank you so much for making Story and Craft part of what you got going on. We'll connect next time right here on Story and Craft. That's it for this episode of Story and Craft. Join Mark next week for more conversation right here on Story and Craft. Story and Craft is a presentation of Mark Preston Productions, LLC. Executive producer is Mark Preston. Associate producer is Zachary Holden. Please rate and review Story and Craft on Apple Podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. You can subscribe to show updates and stay in the know. Just head to storyandcraftpod.com and sign up for the newsletter. I'm Emma Dillon. See you next time. And remember, keep telling your story. Come on.